Hi, Word Balloon listeners. I'm Margaret Larkin, who John has interviewed for this podcast. I lived in Japan and I love Japanese language and I want to share a tip for learning it. Use mnemonics when you're memorizing hiragana. For example, the character O looks like a person dipping their toe in water. The water is hot, so the person says O when their toe touches it. So every time you see that hiragana in a manga, think of that. O, the water is hot. After a while, you won't need the story. You'll just know it when you see it. You can find me on YouTube at Margaret Larkin. That's Margaret Larkin on YouTube. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. It's Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Sutra is here. Quick show note. Uh, you might have heard on uh, the most recent Word Balloon and even on today's episode, my friend Margaret Larkin uh, touting her website and her interviews. Uh, she is giving us uh, manga minutes and anime minutes in terms of a better understanding Japanese idioms and customs. Uh, she is quite the linguist and, uh, uh, you know, really is well versed in several languages. And also, uh, she's one of my favorite people in broadcasting that I've had the pleasure of working with over the years. She does great in depth broadcast interviews for the Illinois Broadcasters Association. And I highly recommend you check out her website, In Kind, as she's been kind enough to promote Word Balloon. Uh, in this capacity of sponsorship, and also to her friends in broadcasting. So uh, really a great person, and if you're at all curious about uh, learning more about uh, broadcasting, uh, Margaret does great in-depth interviews, kind of like the ones I do here at Word Balloon. Okay, enough of that. Moving on to today's episode, I uh, had the pleasure yesterday of being on my buddy Larry Young's uh, show, Dork Court. I love the name of the show, and uh, it's something he does, but he... Uh, in addition to uh, just pop culture subjects left and right, he's also a big Star Trek fan. I've had him on the show before. You've heard guest appearances I've had on Larry's show with uh, his buddy John Price, and I like both of those guys a lot, and I share a lot of their points of view. Well, uh, Larry had me on Dork Court yesterday afternoon on his YouTube channel and on Facebook, and I had the pleasure of... Uh, being on the show and also at the end saying, hey, do you mind if we use this on Word Balloon? He's like, no problem. So uh, we get into a big in-depth discussion about Star Trek Discovery, New Trek. There's actually some new Star Trek news you might have read about in the last day or two. We certainly cover that as well. And it's just a great Star Trek conversation. Uh, I'm going to do my best to have a Trek watch this week. But, you know, Mitch is back from uh, the Lake Como, Italy Comic Con. And it's kind of wiped out. and want to give him a chance to kind of decompress and snap back. And uh, we'll see. Uh, I, I had a, a show without Mitch last week with uh, Franco and Wayne. Um, we're all ready to do the next episode. Uh, there's only two episodes of Discovery left. But uh, if, if we don't, I think this will mollify things until the next Trek watch. So I hope you'll enjoy this conversation with my good buddy Larry Young talking Star Trek on today's Word Balloon. It's been called one of the top three real Comic-Cons in the USA. August 16th through the 18th, Discover Terrificon as it returns to the Mohegan Sun Expo Center in Uncasville, Connecticut. Terrificon showrunner Mitch Halleck has assembled his biggest and best comic creator guest list to date. Jim Lee, Scotty Young, Mark Wade, Adam Hughes, Jason Aaron, Charles Soule, Scott Snyder, Greg Capullo, Brian Azzarello, alongside legends like Chris Claremont, Jerry Ordway, Howard Chaikin, Jose Luis Garcia Lopez, Louise and Walter Simonson, Klaus Jansen, Lee Weeks, and dozens more. Terrificon also brings you the actors who have brought your favorite superheroes to life on the big and small screens. Michael Rooker, Charlie Cox, Star Trek actors Walter Koenig, Nana Visitor, Armin Shimmerman, Ethan Peck, Celia Rose Gooding, and many more. That's Terrificon, August 16th through the 18th. For information on tickets and guests, visit Terrificon.com. Word Balloon is brought to you by AlexRossArt.com. Alex is a good friend of the show, and uh, I am uh, honored that uh, he aligns himself with Word Balloon, and uh, good Lord, we all love his iconic art, uh, whether it's for DC, Marvel, things like Monty Python, The Monkees, David Bowie, so many other great uh, licensed things, The Beatles. Uh, If you go to AlexRossArt.com, you will find great value for your dollar, whether you can... uh, spring for uh, something like uh, original cover art or uh, pages to lithos and posters every price point you can imagine you will find something and a beautiful image from alexrossart.com 
Word Balloon is also presented by my listeners, the League of Word Balloon listeners. Uh, the help that I get via contributions from Patreon, patreon.com slash Word Balloon. You hear the entertainment that I provide from Word Balloon every day, that I do a new episode. Uh, I am very fortunate to have the uh, the great creators of comics and pop culture uh, willing to come on and give you great entertainment. I hope you will consider making an actual cash contribution via Patreon, uh, even a dollar a month. But uh, really, if, if Word Balloon is worth the price of a comic book a month to you, uh, it would be greatly appreciated if you slide that extra money you would put on an issue of a comic book to Word Balloon via Patreon. Patreon.com slash Word Balloon. Thank you, League of Word Balloon listeners. Well, continuing our uh, A level of professionalism here, uh, John, John Sanchez is joining us today. And I were having such a good time chatting just because he's a he's a mensch, man. I love that guy. So we ran a little over, and I was like, oh my God, we have to get talking. So anyway, here we go. John Santres, thank you so much for joining us. Well, let me uh, let me also uh, give you the mensch compliment as well, Larry. It's always great to talk to you, whether it's on your show or my show. And I know uh, John is very busy uh, with life, and I understand that, but I miss John as well. And usually the people that you have on – not only on the the door court, but also certainly uh, your son, Captain America Walker, as I was like to point out, and uh, because you know he's suddenly he went from he went from uh, kid twerp to uh, the super soldier formula, and now uh, he could snap us in too. But I'm also, you said that that's awesome. Oh, oh absolutely, man, and and no, all, all the all the contributors uh, both uh, on the show and on the uh, Facebook uh, group of uh, Seriously Star Trek. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm. What can I say? I'm. I'm always chiming in when uh, you guys bring up a topic. So it's great to be here. Oh, thank you so much. It's so. It's such a mutual admiration society. It's really fun. And you know, sometimes, uh, like that Hollywood sort of like, ah, great to see you. Thing comes across so fake. I'm telling you, I have the same level of enthusiasm talking to you every time, no matter what right. we're talking about. It's always just a joy. It's. It's. I don't know. Well, no, you've always heaped such nice praise on me, and so does John. And then you guys went out and you, you got me the – or if it was you, then just you. Not only a fantastic collection of old Star Trek paperbacks, which was great, including the Blish uh, adaptations, which, yeah, totally come on, we all, we all grew up on of our age, people of our age, but also the, um, the prayer candle that uh, depicts me as Mother <laughs> Teresa and has the my uh, podcast Word Balloon logo on it. And I've showed that to my family at oh, Easter. Oh, and they oh my loved God. It. They loved it. What? <laughs> that's great. The Easter, that's the that's the cherry on top. That's great. <laughs> wow. Awesome. But I we're picking that. a good day. We're picking a good day, man. Some uh, big oh. Star Trek news dropped. A couple things. Star Trek news. Do you want to start off with a Simon Kinsberg thing? Because it'd be my pleasure. <laughs> All right. Because that's, you know, the Holly Hunter casting thing. We could talk for an hour about that, but that's a matter of taste. This Kinsberg thing, like, you have a super good idea of what happens in the industry because I'm so jealous of you because, you know, everyone, and you do a super professional show, and so the beginning and end of your shows are probably always like, hey, this is what uh, George Lucas's butt tattoo looks like. I was over at the ranch, and I happened to snap. You know, so... But me, man, I follow th through the trades, so I have, I have a weird skew on Simon Kinsberg. Although I loved his act. Well, and you know, in the words of Harrison Ford in uh, Empire, I have a bad feeling about this. Uh, it's and also, as you know, we get these. Frankly, I don't think this is more than a trial balloon of a story. And as I always say, when they're rolling cameras then I'll believe it. But even then, as we saw with the Batgirl movie being shelved after it was made, you can't even count on that. But Simon Kinberg, my God, it's like, hey, he's he's going to be, uh, or he's he's in uh, development, pitching a, a Star Trek movie that's going to be set um, before the formation of the Federation and, 
uh, the Klingon or the Romulan war and all that. And it's like, yeah. And it was called enterprise. And also um, it's for the movies. So it's not a streaming show. It's supposedly for the movies. Well, what I don't understand is the Kelvin universe uh, splintered off from the Star Trek prime universe with the USS Kelvin being destroyed by Nero's Romulan ship and uh, that whole thing. So again, um, on the one hand, I'm like, well, you're describing Enterprise, which should have been what happened in the Kelvin universe. But then I also think about a lot of fan films that were made and um, reflect on different ships. And it's like, all right, well, Starfleet's big enough. And and I would imagine uh, United World, United Earth or whatever it was called prior to them joining the Federation was likely big enough that there were other ships. So if you really do want to remove this from Kirk and Spock and McCoy and the like, there's a possibility there, I suppose. I'd like it be in steadier hands than the not so great yeah. Ginsburg. Who well, you, you saw, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. I'm sorry, but you, you saw what I said on I really feel it has that vibe of Rise of the Planet of the Apes. Like they're getting another nine movies out of just going, everybody knows the title. <laughs> to the point where my family and I just went to Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. How was it? It was great. I loved it. Good. Spectacular. Give me some more. But my kid's coming out, and he's all excited because he's a teenager. And he and he goes, well, you know the end of the ninth movie's got to be the astronauts coming back, so it's full circle. And I go, yeah, give me the title of that movie, though. And that kid is so clever. On the sidewalk, being pumped about movies, he goes, it's obvious, Daddy. It's Planet of the Planet of the Apes. <laughs> Outstanding. I was coughed up a lung. Uh, Pretty much, man. Well, anyway, again. Anyway, well, we, think, we think they're doing that. You start like some, here's some vaguely associated Star Trek thing, and maybe some guy is named, you know, Dr. Doctor Spock, the, the kid baby, you know, pediatrician in the 60s is the real ancestor. And then you can just do some idiot thing, whatever you want, and at the end of it, it means Star Trek to a whole bunch of people, and we're all dead. Right, well, like again, that's what they want. Another nine or ten things that they have complete control over. Kirk and Spock, you don't even care about those people. The TV thing can do whatever they want, but the movies is this thing, and I guarantee you that's how marketing sees it. Well, someone in the chat, it might have been Saga Sag or one of the regulars who I see in the chat right now, and a couple of people that have been in the chat. It's good to see everybody, but um, so it's uh, it. you can you can. Um, you, there is room to do something. And if you remember our dear friend, uh, Rob Burnett talking about a project that he was trying to pitch to the Paramount regime that was still in power right around uh, Enterprise. Hey, Walker's even in there. How you doing, Walker? Nice to see you. <laughs> this is our, this is good. Somebody needs to translate this into Latin for us because he loves that so much. Uh, I just say that's a, if you're going to do something, take it seriously, right? But I, I say that to him. And he thinks that's our family motto now. And so, Shooting monkey movies like Shakespeare. That's fantastic. Yeah, that's um, nice. Rob was proposing, and he actually had a real powerful guy helping write it. Uh, it was one of the uh, lead producers on uh, Band of Brothers. And his proposal was, let's do something where it's uh, even before, or no, it was going to take place right after Enterprise. And it was essentially the first incursion of the Romulans. And that they invade Earth and say, uh, we don't like you working with the Vulcans. You, We have an edict. You better remove all the Vulcans from your planet within whatever the time frame was. Or we're going to evade and we're going to beat the crap out of you. And, uh, and it goes from there. And it starts with like a regatta race of boats and stuff. But yeah, it sounded yeah. very intriguing. It was going to be the first movie of a trilogy of films. And then there was a change at Paramount up top. This is when Carrie McCluggage was still in charge of Paramount. And, you know, Carrie was instrumental in starting the Rick Berman era. Well, even before that, greenlighting uh, Next Generation. So, um, yeah, unfortunately, there was no traction to that. But, you know, Rob believes in this. The guy was a real, took his time to really research Star Trek and oh, come yeah. up with a plausible ancestry in that period after Enterprise. But before we get to what I guess now is the lost year era where um, Captain Rachel Garrett, uh, who is obviously going to be 
in uh, the Section 31 movie. I don't trust, as, and I know I believe you feel the same way, I don't trust the keepers of Star Trek to be able to accurately yeah, yeah. or give us something that is plausible and something that we will like. And while I appreciate the idea that you always need new fans and that's great, why would you cut your core audience, us, out of the picture making horrible attempts at Star Trek? And unfortunately, I think in these last six or seven years, that's all we got. Yeah, I agree. It's uh, right, Kurt, done. Kurtzman doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> oh, God. And every time he makes a public statement, I saw him being interviewed and someone said, do you think it's possible? I mean, what an idiot question this is. Do you think it's possible that any of the newer Star Trek shows can reach 100 episodes the way that the previous shows did? Oh, no, I of know. course not. It's a different era of television. But he said what I loved was he's like, well, no, but what we can do is, let's be honest, there were a lot of middling and even bad episodes of Star Trek during that period when we'd get 22 to 26 episodes a season. He said, now we can concentrate on making really good episodes with the 8 or 10 a year. Well, you haven't done it so far. I don't know, Alex. I don't know I, how to break I, it to you. But, I love you know, that because that's a guy who's so far up his own ass, he didn't understand what he said. Because it's the law of averages. If you have 26, 28 episode season, Let's let's say fifty percent are amazing, right? That's fifty percent. If you do that, you all, in your season, you only did four good episodes. Eat it. There's no there's and no way. I think you're being generous saying four. Frankly, I counted I, I know. three. I, know. I, I counted kidding. three last year for Strange New Worlds. Uh, I gave, and I'm, I'm trying to remember the episode count. I think it okay. We just had episode eight of Discovery. I believe I chose episode seven. And said, wow. And I agree with what Saga said. Just said Lower Decks yeah, is the yeah. only show close to having all good episodes. And I could put, well, I would also I would also put Prodigy there, frankly. And we can talk about that in a second. <laughs> but to me, Discovery had one episode that felt like Star Trek. And it was not this last episode in the library. The previous episode where they were still gathering information. And the crew was working as a team to solve the problem. There still were things I didn't like. I I even said it, I think, in the chat uh, under your comments about this season in general. And uh, Book, they give, you know, Stamets gives Book yeah. that Beta Z chip. Hey, gee, this is 800 years old. Well, you're a telepath. Maybe you could read something on it. What is it, an answering machine? 800 <laughs> years old? Give me a break. I, I just, there's no, there's no realism and even Star Trek realism in their things. Right. And I think the problem is. Right. These people come from more fantasy-based shows or completely normie shows like Gossip Girl and the like where they're not dealing with science fiction. They don't know how to write plausible si – or if not plausible That's science fiction, Star Trek plausible science fiction. That I was literally – you know my kid's very interested in writing screenplays. So we're constantly talking about narrative and how stuff goes. And we, the two of us can't watch TV together anymore but with, <laughs> with his mom because – She's like, just wants to figure it out. And we're like, okay, this is going to happen. That's the act two complication. You know? And uh, he, so he will not watch Discovery, but he wants to hear me tell him about it. And he's like, he, so he says, what's the dumbest thing they did? And I said, well, the B story that Stamets and Adira had uh, was that they, they're like, we have to figure out where this gizmo came from. Let's go talk to Jet Reno, who inexplicably has exact information that they find out in less than 45 seconds, which you and me, we're not done talking about what we had for breakfast before we get to the reason why we're chatting, right? But she's not only, anyway, I, and then she tells them, and then they proudly go, okay, let's go tell the captain. I'm like, well, this is weird. Where's the nightcrawler bamfing thing if this information is so important? <laughs> And but they eventually get there and they they literally say, I didn't catch word for word, but as an audience member, that scene read like they were just saying the same shit that Janet that Jet Reno did. Janet Reno, that would be cool. Uh, so it's like, well, that's not research. You didn't do anything. I just asked you if you know some cool fact about Kentucky Fried Chicken. You tell me, and then I tell my wife. I don't go. I researched this heavily. I didn't use Google. Let me tell you, though. <laughs> well, also, um, I think Somebody told it's, me. it's very apparent. <laughs> you can see 
the lack of budget in a lot of the writing choices. And as I listed again in our yeah. Facebook chat, Saru barely being on the show, Detmer and the uh, African woman. Yeah, and I'm yeah. so sorry I never remember her name, but essentially it's a crossword puzzle clue. It's such a yeah, long yeah. Name. it was a cow alphabet something. There you go, exactly. But oh, they they took the Mirror Universe Enterprise back to Starfleet, so they're suddenly gone, and we got John Doe A and John Doe B, or Jane Doe A and Jane Doe B as the navigator and helmsman, and it's like, well, obviously they make less money that yeah. Detmer and Aso, Asewago, uh make. And, uh, and, and that's, I guess, um, whatever, but it's like, that's obvious. And even the point you're just making about Jet Reno, having the knowledge back in the old days, they would at least spend enough money to put somebody in alien makeup and you'd go to a beta Z or a Denobulin. There was a previous episode where the, sure, which sure. also got up my ass. Uh, with Tilly win winning the marathon race, that oh, is more out as out of shape as I am. Give me a break. But also, that's again, an that's an exactly. know, the, the old days they'd make it a little side quest, right? That would be part right. of the episode. It's not Correct. Just like, hey, this guy plays telephone. Oh, he right? happens. Yeah, Jet, Jet, Jet Reno, the engineer, happens to be this knowledgeable book expert. Even yeah, the book yeah. itself. Well, it was handwritten. And there were only a couple thousand copies. Give me a break. They hand people reports and everything else on tablets. Oh, no. You know, screen. on the other hand, uh, I don't buy it. Me and the lads go to this uh, flea market the first Sunday of every month. And uh, I have this weird esoteric amount of nerd knowledge. Like, so one day we found a thinking cab company alien Nostromo hat uh, from 1979. It's like a $300 hat. Wow. I have one already, and that's how I know. This is like a, one of my prized possessions from the old days. And so I told Steve, and he's like, oh, five bucks for that hat? Yeah, I'll give me two for ten. That'll be cool. So the guy feels like he made some money. and But Mark does not get it. He's like, how do you know this shit? And one day we, I, I, saw, I said, hey, who's doing lightsabers? He's like, me. And I said, oh, that's the calculator you need. So what are you talking about? Like, that's the calculator for the bubble thing that's behind the numbers. And he's like, how do you know? And it's like, I get that sometimes characters know weird shit like that. Sure. But but to just present it as an exposition dump is not Star Trek. You would no. have to be... And even, I get it's on a bottle show. And I get maybe you have to use one of your supporting guys. But just make it like, you know, the two of them keep missing Reno because they're right behind her. She's fixing this thing. And then, you know, or... There's a time or just fucking anything other know. than, hey, what's up? Yeah, the plot B in the, you know, slot A. Okay, I see you. We're off to see the captain. It's lazy as shit. It makes me angry. I hear you, man. I got to be honest. And a lot of people, are, and I get it. Why? Well, sh shame on me. <laughs> I respect Tignataro fans, both of her comedy and also the fact that she is a good representation of the LGBTQ community and all that's great. But I have to say her lackadaisical attitude, both in her stand-up and, uh, and on the show, really turns me off. Because, oh, yeah? you know, yeah, I just, I don't think she's funny. I, I totally don't, I, I'll you help know. you. I'll help you deal with the Star Trek Please. part. Um, I get it. Like, she's not for everybody for any of the reasons you can make up, right? But... I personally love the characters that are in some other movie, right? When they show up, like, and the the yes, she's just there, Han Solo. She's yes. so so the the fact that she's lazy and doesn't want to be there and doesn't understand why everyone loves her, it's that's the most fucking Star Trek thing you can do, right? So, okay. so I just think that these JJ guys are in love with doing Star Wars, and. That's I actually I actually give them that one. If you just have a character that is just d get all your yayas out there and don't ruin actual Star Wars. But she's also one of these other, and it is so modern Star Trek. Uh, again, it, the, Starfleet doesn't have to be the Marines or the Army or the Navy, but it should at least be the Coast Guard, where there is yeah, a chain yeah. of command. I'm and, with you. Uh, and it could be a little more casual than hardcore military, but there's still this thing. And, for example, she has that attitude. And even to the point where she oh, uh, no disrespect, sir. Well, too late, Tig. You, you know, and, again, not Tig's fault. This is the writers. But I loved 
when Tilly <laughs> is in Rainer's face. You've got to, you, you know, check your attitude, mister. Well, here's an idea, <laughs> Lieutenant. You're talking <laughs> to the commander. Shut the F up. Right. You know, I, I mean, I'm waiting for that. that. But yeah, I, I mean, and that's why, thank God, finally, <laughs> in that horrible Balance of Terror remake that they did with Pike in Strange New Worlds, uh, where he finally said, Erica, shut up. And it's yeah. like, yeah, I've been waiting for that for nine episodes. It's like everyone's got a little snarky thing or, well, I disagree, Captain. Well, that's fascinating. Why don't you sit in the brig with your disagreement? All right, thanks for your you're input. ready to come and out. Agree. And also Burnham herself. Burnham, I, I just read an article <laughs> about uh, – oh, yeah, I'm not, you got me started, Larry. No, uh, I have so much <laughs> empathy for this. I'm like, yeah, it, I can take a break for a second. It's John's turn. Let's go. One, one of these pop culture news sites and let's rank all the Star Trek captains. Oh. And they put Burnham ahead of Archer. She's still in the middle of the pack. And certainly there are worse captains. And there were even like one shot captains from certain episodes of mostly the new stuff. But I'm like, no, Burnham isn't better than Archer. I'm sorry. And uh, and, and they and they had Janeway as number one. I love Janeway. <laughs> and I, I got, I mean, whatever. I love Kate Mulgrew and I love Janeway. Sure. And in to paraphrase an episode <laughs> of uh, The Odd Couple, when they said if Patton were alive, he'd slap your face. If Janeway were around for Burnham, she'd slap her face and oh say, "Stop God. crying! You're in Starfleet. You're a captain. You're doing it wrong." And and that whole thing in that last episode that she had to look inside herself and realize her own pain to solve the problem. Bullshit! Shut up! It's so annoying. And they have yet to figure out that what made Star Trek great was it's a bunch of people together working together and they always have to congratulate themselves for every little thing that they get right and adira's whole storyline this year beyond breaking up with uh gray of oh i let the time bug on the show i feel so guilty well stop feeling guilty it's not your fault now do your job oh look i can do my job for four weeks we got there and it's like man you really have nothing to write for this person that's really a shame and what a disservice to the character and the actor but that you can't give more things for that character to do. Yeah. It's not that character though. I mean, you said the exact same thing about Pike. It's like you take nine episodes to tell the, the officer to shut the fuck up. And you know, yeah. it's like these guys just protract everything. That's why the eight, Oh, we have eight episodes to do awesomeness. It just rings so hollow to me. And it sounds like somebody who doesn't know or has forgotten what the hell people want out of Star Trek. It's an action adventure movie with cool new science fiction comment, um, you know, science fiction ideas with a, you know, a moral story or some kind of lesson every fucking week. Not like this up and down fucking bullshit well, that they do. Trauma I drama. I keep calling it trauma drama. Trauma drama. And and also. Um, it's very obvious that, and it's been this way for the seven years that these shows have been in production, they don't know how to write one story over 10 episodes or 15 or now eight. Uh, and, and honestly, even this current story, which I'm happy to say a couple things that I do like about this season was Discovery. There are a couple. Oh, let's but, go, yeah. Uh, before I do, I'll say no, this no. story could yeah. probably be told in four episodes. But as far as the good right. stuff, I don't mind what they've done in general with the Breen, and I'm kind of excited that the Breen is there and learning more about them, and I like their planetary politics that are being discussed. I think that's okay. Um, I don't get the difference of uh, the Breen that died that was in the romance with uh, Chiana from uh, Farscape. Uh, <laughs> and I love Chiana, and I like this. I, listen, she looks great as that kind of uh, yeah, actress. I love her actress. Up. She's pretty familiar. I don't remember now who she was, but I was like, oh, yeah, that actress. She has long, dark hair. So, but and even even does, last week, like, she, that, you know. like her B story of uh, her challenging the Breen uh, government and everything, I'm like, okay, that's cool. I'm, I'm all right with all that. That's, that's the one I'm on. I actually haven't seen the one after that yet. Because well, it hasn't come out yet. That's the, uh, oh. that's, that's the most recent episode. And, um, Thursday, we're going to get episode nine and then episode oh, wow. 10. Fantastic. But yeah, it took me, do you know how long it took me to watch all of those? 
out like a long time. I didn't care. Yeah. It's not appointment television to me. I just I don't understand these guys think that they can keep doing this crap and I'm just going to go off and go, oh, well, don't watch it if you don't like it. No, you guys don't understand what being a Star Trek fan is. No, I'm going to be my last brain cell is going to be give fucking Eugene Regassa his guitar back, you bet. Well, and again, as a writer yourself, Lair, I, I get the idea of let's upset the status quo and maybe what we always thought was everything was safe and right isn't. And even further, uh, Rob Burnett pointed out an article, and I understand now even better where likely these uh, writers are coming from. When we grew up, the institutions that ran society were trusted, whether it's the press or politics, even, even in the face of Watergate, that was such an anomaly compared to the regular status quo that everyone was shocked, disturbed, angry, and did something about it. Now, with fake news... And every opinion, be, you know, there's facts and there's alternate facts. Yeah, thanks, Kellyanne. Uh, that that idea has really ruined society. And now I think young people don't trust the institutions. And they don't, and, you know, uh, the Federation isn't always right. Starfleet yeah. isn't always right. We always had rogue yeah. admirals and captains that would do their own thing. I'm just but not, they were called out and dismissed, you know. I'm not sure I buy into that, that's all, because... In the 60s, like one of the best lines in Planet of the Apes is don't trust anybody over 30. Sure, sure. Right? There's a, and then but the that's 70s, not Star Trek, but go on. No, but I'm saying that everybody, the the society was all don't trust the man, you know, don't trust anybody over 30. They the, Then you slide into Watergate, you're not trusting. I, I just don't buy that the people who did the TV we love Grew up in a the 1950s. I think they grew up in the late 60s and 70s. No, they well, if any, well, the, you're right about the Berman era Star Trek people. And that's what I'm talking the, about. Well, if you go back to the original series, though, these are World War II vets. No, that I know. The good fight. I they love fought it. The good fight. And that's so, why they wrote what they what wrote. And that's is, why, yeah, you get to Berman and Pillar though, and they're like, yeah, those World War II guys were fucking right on. Here's what we think. What's about that through our lens. And but it's still Star Trek, right? Right. The right. problem well, I have the modern guys is that here's what we think about science fiction society through our lens of nine hundred two one zero, and it says Star Trek on it, so we need some pointed ears, guys. And that's the part that just it it insults me as a consumer. It's like, yes, you, you told me that this was mustard, and you're giving me mayonnaise. And well, and cool. they grew up. Mayonnaise is awesome, but you told me it was mustard. They grew up on Star Trek memes. They yeah. grew up on the on the internet age of the late nineties and early two thousands, and beam me up, Scotty, and a supercut of Kirk kissing every alien woman he ever came in. I don't even think they grew up on that. I think they well, grew up or, on. Or that's the research they did. Everything and, right, right. And, that's the thing. Yeah. That's the research they did. And it's like, yeah. well, we'll get the vibe and it'll be cool. And like, well, no. every, now, <laughs> every now and then I'll hear a current writer being interviewed. And I, I, I heard one gentleman, I don't remember his name, and I don't mean to pick on him, but he's like, yeah, I spent a weekend watching a shit ton of Star Trek. And now I'm considered in the writer's room the Star Trek guru. And it's like, good Lord. And also yeah, a weekend, I don't know there's, over, there's over 700 episodes from the original series through Enterprise, a weekend? I, I don't think so. I don't buy it. Or you didn't watch enough, and you didn't get the right message out of that. They play at Star Trek. They don't. I mean, I, I Rob said this on his show, and I and to me, Rob Burnett is like Star Trek chess master, and I'm just <laughs> a student at his feet. But I agree with him. They play at Star Trek. They don't believe in Star Trek, and I don't mean in the sense that it really happened but that there's a plausibility in the Berman era Star Treks and certainly the TOS people that they would adhere to, like, these are the rules of the universe. We're going to color within the lines metaphorically and not color outside the lines. And now you got a bunch of people that are just like, you know, just, <laughs> you know, scribbling like we did when we were three years old and had crayons yeah. in our hands. It's, it's so disappointing. And it's, I never thought I'd be like a Star Wars troller. <laughs> and I suppose maybe because of my attitudes, I could be perceived as such. But no, I'm a broken hearted Star Trek fan. 
Yeah. We are we are unfulfilled with. I mean, the it's, promise it's, of hey, new Star Trek, great, excellent, and the crap we've got it that that's supposedly Star Trek. <laughs> even in the best examples of Prodigy, and I would say to a degree Lower Decks, that has only gotten better, and that's great because they really did kind of find their footing. Yeah. So. Yeah, it just makes yeah. me sad. I think you you hit on it with heartbreak, man, because I'm not shy about saying this is my religion because I enjoy all, all narrative and pop culture narrative is really cool. But you got to have you have to understand, like, you know, I come through that I with comics and there's a trick and I didn't realize I never really turned anybody on to comics because I had comic book reading buddies. Until I met my my girlfriend, who's my wife, I meet Mimi, and she's like, you're always reading comics, but what's the deal? And I'm like, okay, here you need Understanding Comics by Scott McCloud, and you need uh, uh, Dark Knight Returns. So that's what I was like, here, try this. And then for it was for Valentine's Day. I also got her some ruby garnet earrings, garnet earrings, just in case. Nice. And she ended up liking the uh, Understanding Comics best because... She, she was at the forefront of web stuff. She actually designed Bank of America as a website back in oh, 96. Wow. wow. So she was really into the whole graphic user interface analog thing of comics and how there was a trick to reading the balloons, right? I mean, it's the left and right Z pattern, basically. Yep, you know? yep. But, but if you're not familiar with that, it looks like gobbledygook. Right until you learn it, and then you're like, "Oh, it's like it's like riding the bike. Somebody has to tell you you have to do this and stay this. And you got to feel it." And that's what every single one of those <laughs> those probably really talented writers uh, are missing in the writers' room about Star Trek is that yes. they just don't they're not feeling the Star Trek thing. They'll write something and plop it down, and it all works, and that's great. And this character moved from here to there. And yes, they got the fourth puzzle piece, and that's where we should be in this season. But that's nonsense. That yes. is not Star Trek, and they should cut it out. <laughs> you're right. No, you're right, man. Again, anyway, it's... so that's why I kind of like the Kinberg thing, because if they follow the Planet of the Apes thing, where, well, hey, this is some weird thing about where the germ of all that shit happened. If you love Charlton Heston, it's James Franco's fault because of some Alzheimer thing back in the day. So if they if they do that, where they start off with some like something, some rogue captain that says something, and then they're like, "Oh yes, that reminds me," when this happened in like you know <laughs> 2060 or something, and then sure. that's the germ of whatever happens in the Federation. If they if they kind of pull it like that, then you can do the second movie that just picks up where the 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 past thing is, and you've already knocked it into Star Trek, and the idiots won't even remember in three days because they're on to the next thing. So if you look at it like yeah. that, I kind of dig it. <laughs> hey, you know, did Kimberg <laughs> write my Star Trek? But it'll be something else to follow. It'll be a version, well, right? I even I even liked the first JJ movie, the two thousand nine movie. It was fun. It was action. I and it was close it. enough yeah. that I was okay with it. Star Trek Into Darkness was complete crap. I love and that it, too. <laughs> well, I, I didn't. And also, man, they lucked out and missing the Me Too era when they had that gratuitous shot. Oh. And I say this as a red blooded uh, <laughs> male that appreciates the female form. Yeah. I like seeing Alice Eve in her underwear, but what a completely unnecessary scene and and <laughs> so gratuitous that it's like, oh man, come on. This is, and again, <laughs> uh, well, I even made, I, I, I got a, uh, an app. I'm sorry, I, I meant to send it to you, Larry. I ran out of time. Um, a fake, uh, a fake video app, oh. and I made a, I made a uh, a video of uh, Trump saying, "As president, when I get in office, I'm going to do these three things. I'm going to fire Alex Kurtz from ruining uh, the brand of Star Trek. I'm going to reinstate William Shatner on camera as James T. Kirk, and I'm going to make a decree." that all sexy women wear sexy uniforms like they did in the 60s. <laughs> and, and again, complete crap, ridiculous. Loved it. But um, yes, Chris, uh, exact, Chris has the line of Val Eve, turn, turn around. Turn around, here I am. You know, it's like, come on, man. And God bless Val Eve for, for agreeing to it. I, I just think you can fix that, that, you can fix that in two seconds, right? 
Just add him. You fix that in two seconds. If you add a quick scene, you cut to Chris Pine. He's got his shirt off. So there's one for the lads, one there for the go. ladies. There you go. Keep going sure. with the movie. Don't even think sure. about it. Like, but again, that, completely, un completely um, unnecessary. And Star Trek Beyond, the third movie, first of all, you've got one of the most beautiful men in the world, Idris Elba, and you cover him in alien makeup for 95% of the movie? That's stupid. And um, yeah. it, Motorcycles. It just, that's, that's what Well, yeah, and, and, and the Beastie Boys. And again, give me a break, man. It's like what I hated about uh, the Will Smith <laughs> I robot movie when he's strutting to uh, very superstitious and it's like that's like me strutting around to a Rudy Valley 1920s song. My <laughs> time is your time. Give me a break. It's again yeah. it's like some of the stuff they do for a little jolly moment. It's like that doesn't make sense. And also moving back to Star Trek Discovery a thousand years later. That's like if suddenly Vikings were defrosted now. And it's like well how do you think we should solve this problem? Well, first of all, I'd get a couple of goats and sacrifice them to the Norse gods. And then it's like, I don't I, believe I, that. Yeah. I don't believe they are as capable as they are without some sort of exposition of, wow, that was really a crash course in how to deal with the 32nd century that we now live in. Because otherwise, they're cavemen. So, yes, I agree, and I don't understand, like, I get wanting your actors in the political stuff, but, like, you're, really, you said, you're asking a goat herder to join the, the United Nations. I'm like, there's a level of sophistication that you just don't have for what's going on here through no fault of yours, sir. Of course but, not. like, why would they have them being motive powers for scenes? It just takes me out of it every time. Yeah, so, and I also never can forgive Burnham for starting the Klingon War. Uh, I and and also again for crying consistently when Picard and <laughs> and and Kirk did cry. Klingon bastards, you killed my son. And uh, you know, oh God, that great scene in um, right after the Borg two parter when he's with his brother and they're in the vineyard and he's covered in yeah, mud. Yeah. I tried so hard, but I wasn't smart enough. I wasn't good enough. Yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah man. Now that's a like that's a real moment, not character trait that is played over and over again like Michael Burnham. Suck it up, lady. You're the GD captain for Christ's sake. Have some balls. Again, Jamie would punch not only slap you, but punch you for your lack of demeanor yeah. and, and proper, you know, whatever. Oh, I just can't do it. Uh, I would say shut up and get get about your business. That's my uh, attempt at a Jane one. So Kind of like, kind of Shatner, -like. <laughs> a little Shatner. -like, Dude, we're but... getting our money's worth today. That was an epic rant. That was John Price, drunken John Price level. <laughs> Especially with <laughs> all the Janeway, the Janeway <laughs> references because he loves Janeway. I, I love I'm kind of glad that he hasn't joined us because I would have had to point out that Janeway at number one on the list of captains was ridiculous. And then, then he wouldn't talk to me for like three weeks. And, uh, <laughs> I'd have to apologize. Like, yeah, I see you're right. Janeway is the best well, captain ever. And, and listen, I do. I, I would be cool with a four way tie between Janeway, Cisco, Kirk, and Picard because I do think all four have strong aspects. And really, man, they did. That's what's driving me nuts about Burnham as captain. It's like you had a great captain in Catherine Janeway who faced the Borg, who was stuck with no Starfleet to really back her up. Until Barkley fixed the radio, uh, you know it's Done. it's so crazy, man. I want to beg your pardon. I'm listening, but you just gave me an idea for a Dark Court article, and I have oh. to write it down. It's uh, the the top the top ten Star Trek captains are a four way tie. That's the title. There you go, man. Well, that's the thing because man. you're you're right, and the fucking kids. I'll go. Oh, you won't believe number three, and it's like, dude, don't write that article. Write the article that only you can write, you know. But these well, their lack of it. God, uh, Price found that wonderful article about uh, the great Star Trek uh, medical officer, Dr. Henry McCoy, and it's like that's all you <laughs> yeah. need to know. Yeah, and yeah I, read one around to know. That same, I read one around that same time when they're like, Well, the original series never did two parters, really. What do you think the menagerie was, dumbass? But again, they don't know, they don't know. <laughs> Did you see the one I posted a couple of days ago? It's like, why Probably. was Kirk wearing a green wrap around and his badge sideways? It was like, what? 
<laughs> like, it's like, I guess if you were raised on TV and like in the vault and fallout and all you saw was Gilligan's Island. Okay. People don't change shirts, I guess. But like, well, and we also know the military, you have like class A uniforms and dress sure. uniforms. And this can't be a, an article worthy concept. And they're like, well, this happened because in enemy within, he had the good evil clone thing transporter. And it's like, oh, really? You have an 800-word article that's basically, well, because of visual storytelling, right? Right. Which is why the Exeter has its own badge, everyone, who ascribes to the adjustment memo. Shut up. That's idiotic. He didn't know what that's he was That's your guy, man. About. That's your guy, Ron Tracy. <laughs> I respect that. I respect the hell out of that. But just, I even, when, that's when the one know, that's, that's proof, right? Because the doctor has the sciences one. You can That's do true. your nonsense for the other guys with the Constitution. Well, he was a Commodore. He gets his own thing. All right, whatever. But like, then the Defiant, and this is the best one, in Enterprise, and they're like, well, that's non-canonical. Well, wait, what? Like, all of Enterprise isn't canonical because uh, Riker and Troy show up at the end and it was all just a dream? <laughs> no, they were just reading a book. Except Historical it was a holodeck, right. right? Like all yes. that shit really did happen, you chumps. <laughs> yes, you're being nice calling them chumps. No, they're idiots, man. Ooh, I'm going to anyway. make sure my uh, – hold on. My, when, I was, my, when I was younger, I got really mad about that. I don't okay. know why. I'd like to apologize to everyone, but so now it's just a pose. But, uh, yeah, man, it's visual storytelling mm -hmm. that I'm defending. And before it just seemed like I was defending a dumb shirt on a TV show, but it's not, sure. it's, a, it's a legit thing that you need to recognize. That's all. I'm sorry. I'm bending over. Cause I'm making sure my, uh, my uh, internet doesn't uh, wink out on me. And if it does, I will immediately jump to my tablet and continue the conversation. But right okay, now I'm having cool. an activity. I Walker issue. asked me uh, this morning, he goes, you going to be okay. Because, you know, I don't do this a lot. And I, and I said, yeah, and you know what? John Sontrez is a magic man because even if something goes wrong on his side, he'll, like, tell us what's happening on the way out. And, and then we'll we'll go, oh, okay, cool. And then he'll come back in and like, hey, everybody. It's And then you describe, that's what I'll do. And I'm like, yeah, that's awesome. I, well, sadly, it's happened to me before, so I, I kind of know my contingency plans. I've got my backups. It might take a minute or two, but no, we're cool. Um, yeah, I, uh, well, Holly Hunter in, uh, before we forget on the oh, other, right. Video, let's go to that Starfleet, the the Starfleet Academy. She's going to be the captain. Uh, that's great. That's fantastic. But every actor is only as good as those scripts they're given. And I don't have faith in these people. Yeah. I, and, and I mean, I'll, I'll reserve ultimate judgment when we see it. I wonder but, if the whole like racial Burnham gender thing is going to come up where if, in the old days, if you said, I, I don't dig on this, it's idiotic. She's always crying. They're like, well, you don't like women. You don't like African-Americans. It's like, no, I just love Star Trek, and this isn't it. And, well, and so I hope that doesn't happen because Holly Hunter's fantastic. I think she would make an amazing Star Trek person, like somebody in the Federation, like dean of the college or captain of a ship or lead the whole show. That's fucking great, except... I don't see any Star Trek coming from the characters and situations. It's Tilly is a professor for kids. And it's like, can you just put Holly Hunter on a ship and kick some ass? Because that's all anyone wants. Well, can we, uh, can we have rain? Can we have a Rainer show after? Oh, after Rainer would be great. Oh. Right. You know, oh, and it's so funny. I've been watching, I've been watching uh, Galactica, the re the Ron Moore Galactica. And he's so wonderful in that as one of the Cylons. And as soon as they announced him being on this season, I'm like, well, that's a good casting move. Oh, and for the man. most part, they've done him reasonable justice. But mm. I, I don't trust this group to be able to maintain that. Well, uh, just you know, over a season. Right? <laughs> well, but already Rainer is drinking the Burnham Kool Aid. And, yeah, you, know, yeah, you know, whatever. He's just. I just love that guy because that's the character Star Trek needs. I would oh, love absolutely. him and Sar Saru on a ship and, you know, and then have some third character that you have to invent because it's something new 
or Star Trek, but have that be their dynamic where, you know, yeah. Rainer's the, like, to be, and Star is like, or not to be, you have to admit. And then your well, third character is like, that's the question, and then you shoot your narrative. Dude, it's the easiest thing in the world, and they don't do that. But can no, I because they project one direction and one opinion, and they are always right every one of these shows. Um, I, I can't say that about Lower Decks and Prodigy because they at least have a little more uh, teamwork going on. Yeah. Yeah. But in Strange New Worlds and in uh, Discovery, it's, well, we're morally right. I keep going back to that Strange New Worlds episode where Una had her trial. Yeah. And what a missed opportunity to legitimately explain the Federation and Starfleet standpoint about genetic manipulation. And as they said in the Deep Space Nine episode, uh, with uh, great with great intellect comes greater ambition, right, and right, and right. you really explain the slippery slope of Khan and his followers were genetically enhanced, and we it's a master it's a super master race. We don't want that. We don't need that. They did say uh, that there might be a, a exceptions of you know. Um, someone, you know, needing the genetic manipulation from an injury standpoint or whatever. But again, uh, they decided instead to tell um, a metaphoric story that you can apply to people of different colors. You could certainly uh, apply it to different sexual orientations and that kind of discrimination. That's a choice. They made it. And aren't we, I say we're right and they're wrong. And I don't mean that to say that that argument, and I don't mean to give that, uh, sort of yeah. Karen-esque uh, uh, attitude. But Karen it's like, Ed. yeah, dumbass, we all agree and know that. But this is more complicated than that. And instead of giving us an intellectual uh, question, much like Measure of the man, of a Man in Next Generation when Data was on trial, we got a, well, it's wrong to discriminate. Thanks a lot, really. Gee, we got the memo, thankfully, starting about 60 years ago with the Civil Rights Act. But okay, Okay, this is obviously new. And again, you got jerks out there that are happy to, you know, they beat their chest about nationalism and things that is clouded uh, discrim discriminatory attitudes. Again, <laughs> yeah, I just, yeah. I don't buy it. And you, you, you kind of crap the bed. And I, and I even have a, a good television friend who is really known for writing great uh, television in the vein of Law and & Order and other courtroom shows, you know, Boston Legal and all that. Uh, and he's like, oh, I really liked it. I'm like, yeah, but what about this? And he's like, yeah, wow, I didn't think about that. Yeah, you're right. And again, I don't mean to say I'm right or way to go, but it's just like you, you, there's an opportunity to tell a really interesting intellectual debate where you understand both sides. And that's why it's like, no, it is it is a complicated issue. Hell, I, I never thought, I'm like, wouldn't it be great if we can help the blind see and the deaf hear? And there's a huge deaf community argument of if you do that, then our deaf culture goes away. And it's like, wow, I never thought of that. It is more complicated than just do this simple binary fix. And then we've got a better world. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> For example, here's Please. my, you brought this up earlier and it just popped back up into my head. That the main thing that shows me those guys don't know what they're doing over there is that, Guys like us will have legitimate criticisms that get read just because of who we know, you know, and it's hard not to think that sometimes some of our stuff gets addressed, but they don't know why they're addressing it. So stuff like this happens that you brought up. There's, uh, yeah, our, our missing bridge people that I never learned their names because they didn't tell us for a season and a half. Right, and then they four have and a half season. Well, whenever, yeah, you're right. First I guess guys, when Pike shows up, he goes, "Oh, hey, everybody," and it's really awkward. And but they kind of sold it because it's kind of an awkward scene. So I spot them in that, and then they call everybody by name, and you kind of remember who you remember, but because it, it doesn't matter because they don't give anybody any other things to do, you know. And that's fine, except that you get to this season, and they're like, "Oh, hey, Mitchell, do this," and "Hey, Jones," and you're like, "Who the fuck are these guys?" that you are talking like we're supposed to know who they are. And it's because they got the note that, oh, everybody has their favorite up there with our main guys, and somebody identifies and will give everybody to identify with Linus because 
Who doesn't think that they're a little nictating membrane lizard guy? I get it, right? Except that has to go organically, right? And there's ways to do it when you're writing it. You got to give them a little bit of business and hope yes. that it creates over the story. But these motherfuckers either will not do it or don't know that anyone gives a shit. And it's right. like I've never seen people with a waiting audience offer an entertainment that is not the thing that the waiting audience wants. Well, and here's my theory. It for five years. No, here's eat, my theory. Eat the gruel. Eat the gruel. No, fuck. They, it. you know, and I don't know the exact number, and I am a SAG member because the radio and TV uh, union merged with the Screen Actors Guild. That's awesome. Oh yeah, a couple of years ago, it was great. I got screeners uh, during award season, everything. Oh, wow. But I know there's a pay scale of if you have less than four lines, you're paid X amount. But if you have more, then you deserve more money. And I truly believe a lot of those bridge crew people, they make sure very carefully that they have less than four lines every time they speak. It's kind of somebody's and, job to check. And it. that's, yeah, and that's, uh, that's what I'm saying. That the, And I get it because Paramount is in trouble. But what they could do instead is what they're going to do next year with Strange New Worlds <laughs> in giving us only eight episodes. Uh, spread the money more around. And again, yeah. I don't know. How, like, again, Larry, I know you, me and China were saying this. Uh, so much of the action happens on the bridge that you've got to know these people. And also in that library episode, I'm glad they finally showed who was in command because I'm like Rainer and Burnham are on the planet. Saru's well, Saru's his own captain now. Yeah. I'm like, who's in charge of the ship while both the commander and the captain are gone. And then we cut to and I don't know his name, but the Asian actor. Yeah, I mean, yeah. in the original series, it's like, okay, Spock and McCoy are, are on, on the planet. Scotty's in charge. And if Scotty's not there, then even for a while, we had Mr. DeSalle in charge. You yeah, know, I mean, yeah. we I knew. I was just going to say, like, and even that, it's like when DeSalle shows off, they shoot him like he's the fucking captain, right? It's yep. like, all right, I'm the guy in the chair. Let's have some Star Trek. Yep. And the, these people just don't do that. And I don't understand. Oh, it. I thought I thought the Asian actor did a decent enough job uh, so running generic. things. I mean, and, and that's okay. Like, you know, he was still in contact with Rainer or Burnham whenever he needed to be. By the way, you mentioned earlier the instantaneous transporters. Uh, well, that's why you got a fat ass like Tilly farting <laughs> around on that stupid ship. Because she doesn't have to walk anywhere. Uh, I mean, and it's what an unnecessary... Tech, that's uh, all right. Here's another Dork Court uh, uh, article uh, idea. Most unnecessary Star Trek innovations in the 32nd century. I would put instantaneous transporters anywhere as one. I would also put the detachable nacelles that from last season that beyond showing us that they can do it, what is the purpose of them? And how come we haven't seen we saw the sopper, the saucer separation on next generation more times than this idiocy? And at least it made sense with the saucer section because <clears throat> you've got the Starfleet officers that if they got to engage in battle, they're gonna be on the battle bridge and the main part of the ship, and the saucers where the civilians live. So let's get them out of danger. That's why you have a saucer separation. But oh, detachable nacelles, big fucking deal. <laughs> no, it's just not it's for no it's reason. Stupid. And again. The, that's what drives me nuts. They, from a visual standpoint, those stupid things aside, I'll give them credit. They're slick looking shows. I mean, they've got Starfleet uh, uh, ships that move around like they're fighter planes rather than the giant battleships. And I mean, digging yeah, yeah. into the uh, into the the one planet's um, ground to stop the avalanche and stuff. It's like. That shouldn't be able to happen. I'm sorry. And there should be a lot more damage to the two ships. I just, you could got. spend hours on just each one of those, but the instantaneous transporter thing, I think, is it's just emblematic of what they don't think through how that would work. And like, just even spotting them everything that, that you're crossing through a threshold from one place to another and that the computers have all made sure that everybody's clear and you're not walking into a wall or some car or some shit spotting them all that. I really find it hard to believe if anyone has ever like gotten their wisdom teeth out or something that like that when you're in one place and then wake up in another is disconcerting. Even if you understand what has happened, 
But to have that happen in a millisecond where you're in a grocery store, but now you're in a law office with all of that cacophony that you just left, not what's in front of you, I think would really damage culture. And it, that would be cool in a science fiction way, but you, in a novel, you'd spend three chapters on that, right? But yeah, yeah. All these guys did is make me not give a shit of whatever was happening in the episode while that was running, because I had that entire thought that I just spoke to you about while the fucking show was on folding laundry, because I didn't care. And this is why this is my religion, man. I don't understand how that has happened. I always refer to uh, Star Trek as my stories because I get, yeah, I'm sure yeah. you guys get as well. Uh, well, if you don't like it, if you don't like it, stop watching it. Why are you watching? It's like, because as you say, it's your religion. I'm right, like right. grandma with her soap opera. These are my stories. <laughs> and they have been literally since I was four or five years old. And it only intensified yeah, during the wilderness years between uh, the original series and syndication and the first movie that I would buy the very paperbacks that you sent me uh, (laughs) and, and, you know, and would read the best of Trek uh, that were collections of just great essays of, well, how, how did the Vulcan society (laughs) allow Sarek to marry Amanda? And, and, you know, why did that happen? And you'd get this great essay of several pages of this one person's theory because they took it seriously as well. Yeah, so no, yeah. man. And you're right. They make these technical choices, <sighs> the, the turbo lifts, oh. <laughs> you know, the, the gigantic cavernous turbo lifts. What? It's, like, it's a fucking elevator. Don't be stupid. Yeah. But doesn't it look cool? No, it looks stupid because it makes no sense. These, <sighs> these ships don't have infinite space. That right, you, what would I that mean, be even for? Right. Like you don't need a giant open space for maintenance, and right. now, and it looks like the inside of a UPS tracking thing. So oh, I, I think I, it looks. I think it looks like the inside of uh, if the uh, the trams that uh, are between mountains for ski lifts okay, and that's yeah. you know those like like in the sure. Bond uh, on our yeah yeah those trips. gondolas right yeah yeah but yeah, yeah and and you know they're suspended on the wires and stuff that's what they look like and it's like. Oh no, yes. no, wrong, dare I say, wrong. I don't and, it's like, and again, aren't we cool? Look at all the cool innovations we do. You guys suck. You don't listen to your <laughs> science advisors. Uh, I mean, there's that whole thing too, where at first, and I've I've actually known a couple of people that have worked on the show and asked them, You've got a science advisor, and yet, and it's like, well, just because we have a science advisor does not mean the main writer's in charge listen to the science advisor and that's man i wouldn't i wouldn't want my name on the show if that were the case you know why did they let them do that though it's embarrassing right somebody just needs to have a quiet word because that's alex kurtzman who's doing that they go hey hey listen alex uh yeah i mean that was great man but like you can't do that (laughs) well and listen rick rick berman certainly has a lot of warts on his own and was misogynist at times was really shitty to Terry Farrell would tell no to Ira bear when obviously Ira bear had the right idea and ultimately it give in the bear when it came to DS nine. But that said, um, Michael and, uh, Denise Akuda, who I really do love and I really respect, uh, Michael really, uh, it, it, to try and protect these people are like, you know, they're, they're trying really hard. Yeah. So cut them a little slack and I'm sorry, I'm a viewer I bought uh, the streaming service because I wanted to watch new Star Trek. You are robbing me of my money every month with this. We're trying the best we can. You're not trying the best you can. You are under the impression that you can change things and you think it's for the better. And we're all just a bunch of old fuddy duddies that won't accept change. And Because also I did hear a fair uh, criticism from my writer friend who, uh, Spoke to Bijou Trimble, one uh, of the great, you know, she and her husband, John. Oh, of course. As you, as you know, we're in charge of the letter campaign. Yeah, John just passed a couple of weeks ago. Yes, yes. Yeah. And uh, my, yeah, friend was walking, were awesome. my friend was walking around San Diego with Bijou. And he, she's like, what do, you, what do you think of, you know, the people that rank on New Trek and everything? And she said, you know, there were a lot of people in my generation that ranked on Next Generation and never, never liked it. 
because of its difference to TOS. You know, sometimes you have to let a new generation like the new thing. Well, I do know for the majority, even the, even the people that never got it, there's so few people that I've known that never got into Berman era Trek. And I do think there are more people that disagree with the direction of new Trek. And, um, Though, uh, God, I just read an article that, um, unlike Picard season three, that managed several times to be in the top 10 of most watched streaming shows, we had one episode this year of Discovery, the third episode. And that's the only one that made it. It made it at number nine or number 10. And wow. since yeah. no, and I am, I really do believe that there are legions of Star Trek fans that gave up on Discovery. Yeah. Of I course. Feel like the bike show. It's well, like yourself, you. Look how long it took you to really watch this season, you know. Here's the thing, too. I don't uh, something I'm personally struggling with the whole like, you know, it's my religion thing. But it's like I really enjoy the narrative and the narrative just blows in this show. But in the old days, I liked Voyager okay, but near the end I kind of like I just came back to see what happened. But I didn't see sure. like a season and a half at the end and it didn't impact my life in any way, right? And the yeah. same thing happened with Enterprise. Agreed. Like, okay, I get the idea. Wake me up at the end. And I, I enjoyed the whole like last half of the season when they let Manny Cotto just do what he wanted. Because I was like, yes, that's the show I wanted. That everybody. Right. So, I, But it only impacted my life in a good way. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm glad to see they pulled it out. For some reason, I just cannot give up that Discovery is not a good show. And I have to keep watching it, and I, because it, it's a personal insult to me. That's that's all I figured out, and like that's really weird, man. Because I kind of mean that, you know. It's like, hey, like you said, we put in the work, man. I'm 60 years old. And I've been a Star Trek fan for about 58 and a half, right? I didn't know what it was, but I thought the all that one was awesome. That was for me. Yeah, yeah. Batman and Voyage of the Bottom Sea and Star Trek and Land of the Giants. That was me. And, I, uh, I'm so with you, and uh, you know I'm only a few months younger than you. Yeah, yeah. I'll be so, 16th December, so yeah. Whatever they're feeding us now is not the good stuff, and I don't understand if somebody keeps telling you in the restaurant, "Hey, man, your eggplant parmesan is just not up to snuff." You have to figure it out, or people are going to go away. Rick and Berman is still on a for sale. <laughs> yeah, I no, I'm I, I didn't mean to step on you there. Oh, that's Rick right. Berman Rick Berman is still around. There are so many other writers that have gone on to make great television. Renee Ch Chavara, uh, Ron Moore, uh, a lot of these men and women. And it's like you could ask them, well, how did you do it? How did you manage to stay on budget? What did you do? And they don't. And that's why I have no patience with Alex Kersman. He sucks. I am nervous about Simon Kinberg writing a Star Trek movie because he sucks. And it's yes, it just yes. seems like Paramount keeps going, hey, uh, can I, you know, if this were a metaphoric uh, car dealership, uh, tell me more about the Yugo. Can I, uh, right, right. you know, the Nova that's uh, sitting uh, there. John, you know? here, here's the thing, right? The, the thing about Star Trek is that show has always been brave. And the people who run it now are not brave. And so the all Star Trek needs is like my kids. I told you, I mentioned twice here. He's screenplay. We talk about narrative all the time. You don't need, I say all the time, I can fucking write a Star Trek that make you cry. And I could, but who gives a shit? You want somebody because every, how Star Trek is done is not a secret. They can't fucking do it for some reason, but somebody like me could do it all day long. What they need is somebody who understands TV who knows why the audience loves Star Trek. They don't have to be a Star Trek fan. You just have to watch a couple episodes and go, that guy sings. That guy has conflict with that guy. This guy secretly likes him. I'm telling you because that's what I'm going to do in my show, which is all they did in the old time. And now everything has to be this like corporate massage, tried vertical. Who gives a shit? Give me well, Star Trek. <laughs> they think they're being they think they're being brave because look we have trans characters on the yeah. show and look oh. we have women in charge and that's great but I always say I forgive all the metaphors I've been throwing out there but it's like a board game 
And it's like, look, we have trans people and we have women in charge and all that and all the DEI stuff that everybody is asking for. Great. If it were a board game, you pass square one. But now you're on board. square two. What does Adira do? What That's does Ray do? It's and it's, a, there are no answers to those questions because yeah. they think, well, mission mission accomplished. There they are, representation. Representation is great, but we knew what Sulu brought to the bridge. We knew what Ahura brought to the bridge. We knew at the height of the Cold War what Chekhov brought to the bridge. And, and uh, you know, by the way, I don't know if I told you, Lair, uh, my buddy uh, Mitch uh, Halleck, who uh, runs Terrific. Oh, yeah, Mitch, of course. Yeah, he's got a great uh, lineup of Star Trek people. We had it last year, but it was in the middle of the strike, so they right, couldn't do right. panels. But I met I everybody. I remember that. Yeah. And it was just heartbreaking because I was so ready. And thankfully, everybody was still cool. And so, just from a fan standpoint, I got to meet everybody. But we're going to have Ethan Peck and um, Cecily, three names. I forget her name, but Uhura, Uhura from Strange yeah. New Worlds. We're going to have uh, Kira, Garrick, um, Quark. I think that's it. From uh, DS9 and uh, Walter Koenig, Chekhov. Oh, all right. all right. And I'm thrilled. And I can't wait to talk to everybody and have panels with everybody. Please don't go back on strike, Screen Actors Guild. Yeah. Because yeah. you're going to break my heart again. But yeah, I'm, I'm very excited for that and really look forward. And I'll be honest, because with all of my complaints about New Trek, I'm, I'm really challenging myself to run a positive panel with Uhura and Ethan Peck Spock uh, because. I have more problems with Strange New Worlds than pluses, but I mean, I'll manage. I'll be okay, and I won't bring them up because they are just my opinions. Who the hell cares? And it's a party, so let's let's have a positive talks. I do think Ethan Peck with the material and uh, Cecily, whatever her name is, uh, I think they, they achieve again. I, yeah, I know I'm an asshole. <laughs> it, awesome. it is, but yeah, whatever. Um, it's not. It's never the actor's fault. I would say that about yeah. Sneed yeah. Martin Green and Anthony Rapp and Tignataro and the entire cast of Discovery as well. Not their fault. It's the writing. It's the it's the people in charge. The Kurtzman and the writers yeah. are really fucking this up. Yeah, yeah. Ethan yeah. Peck Ethan is Peck crushing it. When he first showed up as Spock on on Discovery, I was like, oh, dude. And but then he came back and they they made adjustments, and I was like, oh my god, here's a time where, you know, I would have. I was ready to throw that guy over the side. And I was like, oh, I no, hear you. now I really enjoy. I know I know Price doesn't, but I really enjoy his well, take. It's I, I haven't heard Price directly, but my problem is they treat Spock like he's a freshman at a new high school. Yeah. And he doesn't, and he don't, he doesn't understand humans. And that humans, that Mabenga is the guy that gives Spock the Vulcan harp? Come on. <laughs> and, and again, the way that Ortega's been <laughs> – all the women are oh Spock, you just don't understand. Bullshit. Bullshit. I'm gonna go watch one when when we finish up. You're absolutely right. All that stuff is not a ding to me. I that's the that's the soap opera stuff I kind of get a kick out of. You know, well, when and yeah. I love I love Jess Bush. Oh my god, she's great. She's uh and she's lovely, but she's kind of an asshole to Spock. That's and she's the one it. that initiated this whole crush. And then they do the musical episode where it's like, yeah, fuck you, Spock. And I'm singing about how I don't give a shit about you. And it's like, okay, I guess uh, that's your choice. But it kind of makes you look like an asshole. Um, and also, by the way, in comparison, are you a Doctor Who guy? Uh, yes, I am. I haven't watched Friday's episode, but that episode where they go back to the 60s and yeah. they deal with uh, the demon, the music demon and everything. Yeah. And it ends with that song. There's always a twist at the end. Yes. Infinitely better than the musical <laughs> Strange New World episode. I can't remember one song other than, and I don't even remember lyrics, but I'm Spock and I'm depressed and blah, blah, blah. And also that ending, their big their big musical number at the end. Hi, I'm, I'm Uhura, and you may not know who I am, but I'm the communications officer. Well, that's like saying you've got a party line back in the 1930s, and you don't know who, or, you, or Mayberry. Hello, Sarah? Sarah, connect Uhura, <laughs> connect me to the bridge. You don't know who I, Lieutenant Uhura is? Or I love how outraged Vincent? you are because on paper I should be like a hundred percent with you. Well, and I again, am because, because I hate musicals. I think it's idiotic. But this one kind of the the amount of that it worked for me was a hundred percent Jess Bush because she sold that because all your points are hundred percent. Oh. Right, like what was that about? I don't know. It was uh, the songs were so moving the plot along. I don't remember it. Who cares? But I don't even remember the singing. 
and stuff. I know Spock was floating around or something once. But when Jess Bush starts singing through the bar, you're like, holy shit, this is like every like ingenue World War II movie thing ever. And sure. my eyes were like riveted on it. I didn't really like, <laughs> I wasn't really, I don't think she's cute or anything. They weren't oh, really writing her very well. But oh, after that, I was like, holy shit, that actress is doing something. And I went back and watched all her press they do on Ready Room. And man, I'm in love with her because she is killing it. I actually think she's the best actress on the show. I really well, and and I, on the one better hand, than Anson Mount. I, I, I respect that. On the one <laughs> hand, I'm glad they gave Nurse Chapel more agency yeah, than the yeah, original well. series, yeah. and that's not hard to do, right? <laughs> uh, but that said, how does that woman become? the nurse chapel that we know from the original series. That's the problem with I, a lot I don't of their think they're answering that. Well, I, I, I hope they're all on their own trip now. And nobody's I hope the ultimate, there. Well, and they don't, well, and they, uh, God, the way they push the con story, uh, decades, uh, right. later, I think it's like, it's yeah, but they, again, they, don't, thing. they don't think because if you're moving it that far in advance, then, uh, the botany Bay, which would left Earth's orbit in the 90s wouldn't encounter the Enterprise in Space Seed, the original series con episode, because it's decades later. Time and space, everybody. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, that's, that's as basic as you get. That's my fifth grade science kind of, you know, knowledge about science and everything. And these numbskulls don't get it. And if they don't, at least then admit at the end of the day, this is a different. Well, universe. yes, let me help you. Let me help you with this. this is the Go only ahead. thing that lets me sleep at night. If you think about the original series, just Coke, right? Coca-Cola. And then new Coke happens. The the JJ weird shit that turns into secret hideout sure. TV bullshit. That's new Coke. It's not right. gonna go away. They're gonna we're right. just gonna have two kinds of Coke. Yeah. And then Except co- classic Coke now is going to be Kinsberg's TV uh, new th- movie thing, because I ha- I got a feeling that he's just going to do here's the Revolutionary War series that leads into Nixon or whatever, right? And and we're going to get I guarantee you the end of the first one is going to we're going to get Kirk and Spock and McCoy on the bridge, and then then they're going to be like this is there the movies are going to be Kirk Spock and McCoy and we're all just going to eat it. And the the TV is just going to be their own thing, and we're just going to eat it. And well, again, we are. Uh, Noah, Noah Hawley was supposed to make a Star Trek movie. Quentin yeah. Tarantino was supposed to make a Star Trek movie. Yeah. I forget the lady's name, and I don't mean it in a pejorative way when I say lady and not woman. Uh, so I don't want people to misconstrue. We're but there have been so many announced directors and ideas, and none of them have come to fruition. Uh, if this Kinberg project happens. We'll see what it is. I remain doubtful that it will even happen until cameras are rolling. Because, again, I mean, Paramount's, Paramount's in trouble. I can fix it in two seconds that just let everybody do that, right? They're all like, oh, what's going to go on? What's going to happen for the franchise? No. Quentin Tarantino wants to do a fucking sequel to a piece of the action? Yes, please. You, well, don't, you don't have to spend $250 million because you only get to use these sets, QT. And at this time, because we're doing TV, and he goes, "Fucking yes, let's go!" And then, right. well, that's and then that, you're like, "Hey, that Black Sails Pirate was thing was a good TV show. Let's do the Star Trek version of that, where there's fucking Federation pirates. Who gives a fuck? Space is big. No one has any thought, and they have no bravery. And I, it's it's sad. not. I don't think it's the studio. I don't think it's Kurtzman if he's involved because that's TV versus film." I think it's the investors that have yeah, to back yeah, them up. Of course, yeah, it's the money guys that are going. Uh, we don't see it because uh, the last two movies didn't make their money. Right, back. you can't do the money on a different thing every time. That was my publishing model, and why people would be like, "Hey, we want to buy you. Your fucking your company's insane," and you're like, "Yeah, but you can't buy my head because that's what's happening, right?" There's, yeah. I cannot tell you that this person is going to do this project and make this much money off of this return on investment. I can't do it because that's not how it works. So I right. get that Star Trek will never do that, but that would save it. If they would, if they hadn't logged down on it and just went, fan films, go insane. 
and we'll take one every year and release it on our streaming channel. You, you would fix Star Trek immediately. And three guys that did the special effects would get hired for the real one. And it's yes. just no one has any sense about how to be creative because they're all counting the money. Well, again, the Harv Bennett solution to the first Star Trek movie, which was a success, but obviously they rolled in all the Phase 2 and other movie attempts into that 79 budget. But then Harv Bennett came along and said, $40 million? Uh, I could make like five movies with 40 <laughs> right, million. Right, exactly. And he did. And he did. And, and they were great because they were smart stories, but they were cost efficient from a budget standpoint. I mean, Mike, I always point out with Discovery, the first two seasons, when, um, oh, the fake Klingon uh, uh, that, you know, was pretending to be human. Oh, put right. His, put his <laughs> shoes up on one of the cafeteria tables, and you saw, like, gold uh, braids like you would on a, on a uniform and stuff oh, on the right. shoes. Right. And it's right. like, you are wasting money. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. We're never going to see their yeah. boots yeah. Let alone the gold lame on the on the on the shoes, uh, it, uh, and again they they turn away ta- or turn off talented writers like Walter Mosley. Oh my God, that one! Started down in a writer's room. Oh, he's oh, we were triggered. Oh my God, a black man told about his own experience. Oh my God. Well, That's you tough. lost the, you missed the lesson, kids. And yeah, I don't the know, Walter most Mosley amazing going, thing oh, about that is that. They were doing to him what they complain about. I just, it's like, it's so tone deaf to, as to stun me. Well, anyway, John, yeah. man, I have to get going. This is so awesome. Please. I could do this all night long, but I really appreciate you. That, it's a joy to talk to you all the time. Ah, you know, I'll Larry, take out the beginning and put it at the end. Shine your shoes. Can you tell hey, uh, Tell me when your next ah uh, trek is on because I love your show. Well, thank you, man. Yeah, that's a that's part of Word Balloon. Fun. We we try to do it weekly. Uh, Mitch just came back from Italy in the Lake Como uh, Comic Con over there, oh, so we want to give him a chance to relax and decompress. But um, so if we don't have one this week, we definitely will have one next week before the last episode, yeah, and we'll yeah, certainly yeah. have a a season review. If it's all right, I would I would love to uh, release our conversation on my feed as well. Absolutely, John. My that, pleasure. That's great. Yeah, all right. Well, cool. All the word balloon people, thank you then for doing that. But yeah, wordballoon.com. I'm, I'm where you can find uh, podcasts and YouTube and Facebook. And I post my live shows there as well. That's so uh, <laughs> thanks, Walker. I agree. I appreciate that. All right, everybody. Thanks very much. See you next time on the internet.